Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank, I particularly want to thank you uh, and the Phil and the organizers uh, for allowing me to come to Orlando when it's 23 degrees in uh, Chicago. So I'm very grateful and thank you very much. So what I want to do is sort of lift up the curtain, if you will, about what is really going on when we do these operative reports in terms of decoding them and what are we really trying to communicate and what might you expect. So there is a standard template. I'm literally, um, when I was asked to do this, I literally took and abstracted an actual operative report just so that you would know exactly how we um, approach these things. So the first thing um, that we do is this is a standard template that you see that statement of the attending surgeon's presence. If we want to get, the institution wants to get paid, we have to attest that we were actually there for the critical parts of the operation. And with the preoperative and postoperative diagnosis, I just wanted to show you this so that you will see as we go through the case exactly what happened. So at the risk of um, sounding ancient, but I'm actually uh, old enough to remember when, operative, when medical records uh, used to have something to do with the patient, and they used to be um, <clears throat> something that was meant to communicate uh, important things among the providers that were caring for the patient. Now we know that the electronic medical record is a, primarily a billing tool. So to me, the operative report has become even that more important because commonly it's the only source document that has anything to do with what's going on with the patient or what you were thinking at the time and is usually what I refer to um, after the operation in the years going by to figure out because I think we could all probably agree there's very little in the electronic medical record that has any meaning of any kind. So with that, these are the usual things, complications, and I want to highlight blood loss, that I always ask the fellow to tell me what the blood loss is, and that's kind of like looking outside and saying, how many clouds are there in the sky? This is an utterly arbitrary thing. I've always thought we should say the usual, less than usual, more than usual. And the residents and fellows are always uh, intimidated that we're gonna get mad at them, right, Phil, if we, they say a lot. But this is, I always ask the fellow what the blood loss was and then I just put it down, but it's, it's a silly number. Um, in any case, these are the specimens, and I wanna come back, that term, in this case, terminal ileum cecum with adjacent ileosigmoid fistula and an additional portion of small bowel. What's that about? So the indications, this is to me is my, the most important part uh, that I spend the most time on, uh, describing what the phenotype was and what we hope to achieve. So here is uh, on this patient, so that um, this is a very upbeat 21-year-old woman who recently completed her studies at Illinois State. In retrospect, she's had suggestive symptoms of Crohn's disease since middle school and was diagnosed as a sophomore in high school. She's been managed with immunomodulators and biologics um, uh, over the last several years. And I'll say why I include these things owing to her college studies. A lot of her care has been long distance. She's been very carefully cared for by gastroenterologist Dr. YYY. Because as you know, gastroenterologists often feel that somehow they've personally not succeeded if the patient ends up with an operation, and that's certainly not true. You know, that there is no institution that I'm aware of where medicines work uh, every time. And what I'm trying to do is I know how much this gastroenterologist cared for this patient and how hard he worked trying to make her well, and I wanted to acknowledge that uh, in the operative uh, report. So anyway, so here this basically says that she's getting, she graduated in college in May, she's getting married in July, and hoping to wedge the operation in between the two life cycle events. So this helps me when I see the patient, how was the wedding, you know, makes the patient feel uh, cared for. In any case, the findings, we include the length of bowel resected, the appearance of the remaining bowel, and what I like to call a synoptic review of the peritoneal cavity and the appearance of the disease se segment. So what does that mean? So uh, it's getting hard to read from up here. But anyway, so my operative findings was under anesthesia, I could feel a fist-sized mass in the lower abdomen. And um, uh, indeed, at laparoscopy, there was a, cr a severe inflammatory reaction involving the terminal ileum um, with an overt ileosigmoid fistula. I'll let you uh, read the rest. 
But, you know, the whole point is that what a great time to do a thorough inventory of what's in the peritoneal cavity, right? She's a young woman, so she might have right lower quadrant pain. What did her ovaries look like? So, you know, I try and catalog each or pertinent organ in the peritoneal cavity and say that I saw it and describe the uh, findings. I would go through this more, except I can't read it from up here. Um, so then the next part is access. Laparoscopy, again, and laparoscopic assisted, hand port and open, so that it's hard to know what somebody means when they say I did a laparoscopic ileocecal resection. It, all it means is that at one point you put a camera in, but did you do any of the dissection? Did you divide the mesentery? So one might describe those as laparoscopic assisted and there's this entity, the hand port, which um, that if indeed you, it enables a hybrid approach um, that enables you to manipulate the specimen with a hand inside and provide superior counter-traction for cases that you might otherwise have had to do open. And so here's my description um, of the um, operative uh, access. <clears throat> that again, you know, here's that part about the procedure. And so what I'm explaining is that in this case, I could feel an inflammatory mass uh, in the pelvis. And so usually what I like to do is I take my little transverse balloon port out and make maybe a small transverse incision at the level of the umbilicus. But in this, because the mass is substantial, that I'm going to make an incision up and down because I think I may have to alter it. As well, the mesentery is always the key you know, to a tough Crohn's case because the mesentery is often several times uh, thicker, um, in a five, six, seven, eight times thicker in a patient with Crohn's disease than um, in other patients, and I'll speak in a minute why that uh, is pertinent. So then the next thing is the inspection that the disease segment, and I'll come back to this later, the remaining small bowel, because in a reoperative case, it doesn't really matter how much you took out, it means how much you left. So that I use a 30 inch uh, umbilical tape and I measure the amount of remaining small bowel. I think that's critical in interpreting symptoms You know, with respect to should we expect short gut, because I'll tell you that it's, I'm always surprised they do a lot of reoperative IBD surgery and they say, well, I've had three feet out, I've had five feet out, and then you find the whole complement. So I think you can never really rely on the descriptions and there's no reason not to mention it. It's so important to measure it at the time of surgery. And here you have, I'll just, um, in this case, the bowel, this young woman had a, dramatic, had a chronic small bowel obstruction so that the bowel was quite dilated. And what I'm trying to say here is that when we put the gas in, the pneumoperitoneum, that if the bowel is very dilated, there's really not a lot of working space sometimes between the bowel uh, and the abdominal wall. And that's what I'm trying to convey here. And I'm giving the information of exactly what we did um, and how we mobilized the specimen. And then in this case, what I'm trying to indicate is when we exteriorize the specimen, that the sigmoid colon was quite floppy or non-fixed. It came out nicely, and we could put a little stapler across and divide the ileosigmoid fistula um, because the sigmoid was an innocent uh, bystander. And I'm sort of describing exactly how we uh, did this. And um, moving ahead, that, as I said, the key to safety in a Crohn's case or in a redo or a difficult Crohn's case, as I was mentioning, is usually the mesentery. So that, in other words, that we divide it intracorporeally, meaning that we divide it with an energy device, typically, when the um, inside the belly, or we do it extracorporeally, meaning that we cut all of the attachments that hold the intestine inside so we can literally pull it, externalize it, through a small hole, and at least we can certainly argue about this, but personally I don't think the energy sources are safe for a very thick uh, Crohn's mesentery, so for a difficult mesentery I will certainly always exteriorize it so I have the uh, opportunity to control any bleeding with uh, clamps, ties, suture ligatures, the standard thing because again, um, it's the thickness and the associated lymphadenopathy that is really the issue with respect to controlling the mesentery. And then I'm saying this part, uh, the mid-ascending colon was divided, the 
ileum was divided um, proximal to the readily identifiable margin of disease distribution. And for us as surgeons, of course, that from the outside, from the, well, I was going to let me phrase it this way, from the outside, we can almost see if you're experienced where the disease ends because of the fat creeping. And that is that as you get further, as you get close to normal bowel, the fat of the mesentery tends to respect um, the bowel so that you can literally see from that subtle fat creeping usually where the disease precisely demarcates. And so what we're gonna do usually is take a two centimeter um, margin. But in this case, I was wrong. And that is that it's an interesting truism of Crohn's disease that the mesenteries are always, I'm sorry, that the ulcerations are always on the mesenteric surface. So that I personally will open the bowel and look at it. And in this case, I could see a single ulceration um, right at my margin, so I just took another inch, and that's what I'm trying to explain here. And again, the ulcer is always on the mesenteric surface, not usually, but always. And um, um, in terms of where did I divide, what were the levels of transection, did I leave any disease, I think it's important to let you know. You know, we always say that the surgery is going to hit the reset button, that we're going to leave only fresh, healthy bowel, that it's easier to keep it healthy than to make it healthy. But we should certainly comment for sure about whether we left any disease and comment on the margins. And in this case, I'm saying that the patient had a bowel, chronic bowel obstruction, so we suctioned several liters of uh, fluid out of the more proximal small bowel. And what I'm describing here, and there's a, as, as uh, Javier nicely pointed out, there's certainly um, many ways to do the anastomosis that are equally legitimate. Myself and what I'm describing here is that um, I'm going to do here an end to side anastomosis which is my usual preferred method and the reason that I do that is because that's how the we were born with an end to side iliocolic anastomosis and if that's what the nature or the good Lord thought we ought to have well who am I to say different. So I put it back exactly the way I find it, found it, which was in an end to side configuration, but all these other ways are perfectly um, legitimate. You should expect to see whether did we use sutures or did we did use uh, staples. And then here's what I'm describing is exactly how I did the anastomosis. Now you'll see the 31 EEA stapler, which is a big stapler for the small intestine, and the 31 means that it's about a 3.1 centimeter or 31 millimeter diameter uh, anastomosis. And then I say there were two complete donuts that the nature of that firing is when we fire, it staples the two ends together and cuts a ring. So I'm indicating that the donuts were complete. So in fact, the anastomotic, anastomotic device fired um, correctly. And then everything should be tested that we milked enteric contents through the anastomosis and it distended quite nicely and without leak. And then similarly to testing, in this case, being that I divided the, ilio, divided the iliosigmoid fistula and felt the sigmoid was innocent bystander, I want to make sure I didn't inadvertently compromise the lumen um, by my securing of the colonic side, and I also want to test it. So just like the guy who fixes your tire and patches it, blows it full of air and keeps it under water, that's exactly what we do. And that is that meaning that we fill the pelvis with saline and we do a flexible sigmoidoscopy, blow it full of gas, uh, in our case CO2, and see if it bubbles. High tech um, stuff, but that's what we do. So we try and test everything that we do. And I'm just describing that there. And as well, as you know, when you do a sigmoidoscopy in patients with an iliosigmoid fistula, you'll usually see that little tiny bud of granulation tissue or a little ulceration. That's usually what corresponds to the fistula. And I just wanted to make sure that the abnormal area I'd seen endoscopically before was in fact um, corresponding to this fistula and we test everything. So wrapping up, the closure is the closure, the estimated blood loss, don't believe it, don't trust it. I wouldn't even pay any attention uh, very much. Um, we, there is no, it's an utterly subjective, again, how many clouds are in the sky today, but concerns for bleeding. And here's what we're doing is describing exactly how we um, 
closed up and made sure that the anastomosis was pink and healthy, et cetera. So the take home message to me is the most important thing I think that you should demand and, and require is um, a good thorough description of the operative findings. So I would argue that if you're taking care of a young woman with Crohn's disease, it's good to know that she, what her ovaries look like and that she doesn't have cysts on her ovaries and to have a, use the opportunity to um, describe what's in the peritoneal cavity, understand the anastomotic configuration so that when you do your follow-up colonoscopy, you can just quickly look and see how the bowel was put back together and know what to anticipate. That the length of bowel resected is important, but again, especially in a reoperative case, the amount of remaining bowel is really what's important and it is appropriate and it should be routinely and standardly measure that's really important for patient care uh, thereafter. Um, and um, again, that in this era of the electronic medical record, I don't think that we can give up the operative report and make it Dilbertize the operative report. It should focus on useful information that I think you're right to demand honesty and integrity and thoroughness from the report that um, if there's something that's unclear or something that's ambiguous, I think a phone call uh, is really good. I was used to kid for many years, I was at the University of Vermont, and I felt if you were over 50, I knew you and had spoken with you, but if you were under 50, I only knew you electronically. And the phone is still sometimes a very, very uh, good way to communicate. And also, I, and we can discuss this maybe in the panel, is I like to give people back. I assume the way you communicate with me is the way you like to be communicated. So if you've called me about the patient before surgery, I'm probably gonna call you back. If you texted me, I'm gonna text you. If you've emailed me, I'm gonna email you back. I'm gonna assume that that's how you like to know about what happened. And you have to understand for the surgeons is that a lot of gast gastroenterologists are quite different in their preferred method of communication. So we don't mean anything. We wanna communicate with you the way you like to be communicated, but sometimes we just get it wrong. And um, I wanna thank you for the privilege um, of uh, giving this talk and thank you.